Hi everybody, this is Dr. Kat Slees. This is the second video, video B on respiratory system anatomy. We'll focus here on the nose and the paranasal sinuses. Recall that the conducting zone starts with the nose and ends at the so-called terminal bronchioles, which are the last bronchioles that do not allow for gas exchange. Once we hit the point in the respiratory system, in the respiratory tract, where we do see gas exchange occurring, occurring, we've switched over to what we call the respiratory zone. So the last bronchioles where we do not see gas exchange are called the terminal bronchioles, pretty small bronchioles already. There will be one more set of bronchioles or one more hierarchical level of bronchioles beyond that, and they will have a thin enough wall to where they belong to the respiratory zone, but more on them later. So what we'll take a look at here is the, the nose with the nasal cavity and also the paranasal sinuses. I'll have different videos for the remainder of these structures that belong to the conducting zone. So our nose is made up of the external part as well as an internal part or better referred to as the internal nasal cavity. And inside of the internal nasal cavity, we have these fleshy lobes with some spaces in between. I'm sorry, my cursor is red just like the picture, but I do think you can see what I'm pointing at. So the spaces we refer to as nasal meatuses, while the, the structures that create the um, separations between the nasal meatuses are called the nasal conchi. And they're covered with pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue, which provides the right kind of histology to where um, th functions such as these uh, can occur, the moistening and the warming of the air and the filtering and the cleansing of the air. Our nose is also going to play an important role along with the paranasal sinuses with helping our voice resonate. As you know very well, when your nose is congested or your, your sinuses are all blocked off, your voice sounds very different because it just cannot resonate. And let's not forget that our nose is one of our uh, special sensory organs along with our eyes and our ears and our tongue. The nasal cavity has two types of mucosae. The olfactory mucosa, which is located in a small patch in the roof of our nose, and it's characterized by the presence of cells that are specialized in um, detecting chemicals. They're chemoreceptors, better referred to as our olfactory sensory receptors. But the majority of the nasal cavity is lined with a respiratory mucosa with uh, epithelial tissue referred to as pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue with the connective tissue layer beyond that being referred to as the lamina propria, which is rich in seromucous glands. Let's take a closer look at the, the micrograph we see here of our pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue as well as the lamina propria right here. So I've enlarged the picture some, and we can very nicely see our columnar cells that are uneven sizes to where we get the impression that there are multiple layers, but really each one of these is just a single cell. And so we refer to the tissue as pseudostratified. The, the fact that the cells are different heights causes the nuclei to be at different levels, misleading us to think it's stratified and it's not. We also see very clearly the cilia. And then finally, we also see somewhat, not the best one, a goblet cell right around here, perhaps. There might be some smaller ones here too. Um, these goblet cells, remember, they produce mucus. If we then move deeper to the epithelial tissue, we get to the lamina propria right here. I'll just call it LP for lamina propria. 
And in here we see lots of little red blood cells, notice that, um, inside of capillaries. So very vascularized lamina propria. We see some bigger ones here. And there are also glands, seromucous glands, located in this layer, although in, in this particular view I do not see uh, any great examples of seromucous glands. The cilia, as well as the goblet cells of our PCC epithelial tissue, play a very important protective role. First of all, the goblet cells produce mucus. And that mucus is going to help with the trapping of all kinds of particles that somehow have managed to make it down into our trachea or, um, you know, pollen particles or other uh, particles that we inhale. So they get trapped. The cilia then can, with their beating movement, attempt to move those particles that do not belong upward so that um, we can essentially try to um, remove them from the trachea by swallowing them as they reach uh, our oral cavity. So those are two structures that play a very important protective function. Then notice too that in the um, lamina propria, which is mostly areolar connective tissue with uh, which might switch over to some dense irregular connective tissue, we have these glands that produce a watery serous fluid and also mixed in some mucus. And that is rich in lysozymes and defensins, which again are going to go after things that don't belong, pathogens that don't belong. Finally, the very vascularized lamina propria will help warm the air that we inhale. And then let's not forget that there are actually afferent or sensory neurons that will help us sneeze in the event um, irritating particles arrive in our nose. So notice that we have many protective mechanisms uh, happening very early on in the respiratory system. The paranasal sinuses are also part of the respiratory system and there's a total of four. We have in the frontal bone of the skull the frontal paranasal sinuses, then inside of the sphenoid bone we have the um, sphenoid sinuses inside of your ethmoid bone nearby your eyeball, we have the um, ethmoid sinuses, and finally in each one of our maxillary bones we have a maxillary sinus. These again are cavities inside of these flat bones or bones that are somewhat irregularly shaped. They're all lined with pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue and um, the mucus that is generated by this tissue in these paranasal sinuses will be able to drain into our nasal cavity. So what is their function? Well, as I've mentioned before, anytime those paranasal sinuses get inflamed to where their, their lumens become smaller, we start to have a much more difficult time to resonate our voice. They also play a role in warming and moistening our air, and let's not forget that with regards to our skeletal system, they lighten the skull. So this wraps up our discussion of the very most superior structures that belong to the conducting zone of the respiratory system.